Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I'm your host, Dr. Lauren Levine. Many of you know me as a digital dentist. Uh, we have an incredible turnout uh, for this evening's webinar. Obviously, uh, this topic is of great interest. We had close to 1,000 people that were registered for the webinar uh, from people all over the U.S. We also have a number of guests joining us this evening from uh, Canada as well as Mexico. Uh, a ton of you are here and logging in or are continuing to log in. I'm only going to speak for a minute or two. I want to make sure that Dr. Nazarian can speak for as long as he wants. We also want to make sure that we leave time at the end for questions. Now, most of you have been on webinars before. You know how the format works. But for, for those of you who might have forgot or it's been a while, um, on your screen, you have a little go to webinar control panel. You can go ahead and type in your questions. We don't normally get to the questions until the end of the presentation. I think uh, ours is going to be speaking for about 45 to 55 minutes, give or take. Um, we'll have a special offer that we're making after that, and then we're going to get to the Q&A. But just go ahead and type your questions in as you think about them, and we take them in the order that uh, we get them. In the next day or so, you're going to get an email with links that you can download the entire recorded webinar. We record all these webinars. So if you have to take a phone call or you get distracted or you somehow incorrectly think that the State of the Union is more important than this, then don't worry about it uh, because you will be sent a link for the in entire uh, presentation. So with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome back Dr. Arvind Nazarian. Uh, Dr. Nazarian maintains a private practice in Troy, Michigan with an emphasis on comprehensive and restorative care. He's a diplomat of the ICOI, uh, that's International Congress of Oral Implantologists. His articles have been published in many of today's popular dental publications and is consistently listed as a top dental educator. He's conducted many lectures and hands-on workshops on aesthetic materials and dental implants throughout the United States, uh, Europe, and Asia. He's done a number of webinars with us as well. He's uh, faculty for the Amplify Dental Training, which teaches atraumatic extractions, grafting, and immediate dentures. And he founded the Ascend Dental Academy, which teaches all aspects of dental implants. So, Ara, welcome. We're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Great. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you for having me. Well, again, my name is Ara Nazarian, and I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar, Achieve Your Practice Growth with Atraumatic Extraction and Grafting Techniques. Are these the types of patients that are presenting to your practice, whether it's one tooth or several teeth or a full dentition that needs full mouth extraction? This is what we're starting to see that is presenting into our practice. Well, according to the literature, we know that age is directly related to every indicator of tooth loss. However, we also have found that these energy drinks and sugarous foods are also causing a lot of problems to the dentition of our youth. Who would have thought that someone with 32 teeth that are severely decayed would invest in a full mouth implant reconstruction. Well, if we wanna do this type of dentistry, we really have to look at starting by setting the foundation with atraumatic extractions and grafting. So what this means to you and your practice is that there's a huge potential for growth. Well, if we know there's this huge need and that there's a potential for growth, why have more general dentists not perform extractions and grafting? Well, first of all, they were scared of not being able to get the tooth out in its entirety, or they were scared of damaging a blood vessel or a nerve or some type of anatomical landmark. They were scared of breaking off a tooth or having to reflect a flap. Most importantly, they were finding that they were spending a lot of time trying to get teeth out and they weren't getting enough reimbursement for this procedure. So what I found is if you find that a service that you're providing for your patient is stressful, is not performed to the best uh, result that you could possibly get, and something that's not profitable, then you're gonna stop doing those services. So our goal today is to definitely go over atraumatic extractions and grafting so that we can do it in a very efficient and effective manner. So most importantly, we're gonna tap a growing market as we talked about. 
of patients needing these types of extractions. I'm going to share with you proven techniques to atraumatically extract teeth in a predictable and efficient manner. We'll do a quick overview of the different types of grafting materials that are out there. And also, we're going to go into the importance of grafting through a bunch of case demonstrations that I do in my own practice. So these are my actual patients within my practice where you'll see the before and after and some of the procedures this evening. And most importantly, we're setting the foundation for dental implants. And when we do this, we want it to be prosthetically driven. And you'll see what that means momentarily. Well, if we look at the definition of an ideal tooth extraction, it is defined as the painless removal of the whole tooth or root with minimal trauma to the investing tissues so that the wound heals without compromise and no postoperative prosthetic problem is created. When I look at this definition, I clearly understand that this is what I want to achieve every time I remove a tooth. Well, let's take a look at some examples. In this case, we'll show you extraction and grafting with delayed implant placement. The patient presented to my practice with the endodontically uh, treated tooth that had a core and crown restoration, and the core and the crown had broken off several months earlier, and when the patient finally presented to the dental practice, we could see that there was quite a bit of recurrent decay to the extent that this tooth was no longer restorable. So our goal is to atraumatically extract this tooth, build the foundation with grafting, and then later place an implant. Well, this evening we're gonna be talking about the physics forceps. And when we talk about atraumatic extractions, most of us think physics forceps because this is the most ideal way to remove a tooth atraumatically without using great force because the physics forceps works like a modified class one lever. So what do we mean by that? Let's take a look. Well, when adapting the forceps to a tooth, especially one such as this case, where it's severely decayed, we want to ensure that the beak of the forceps is placed on solid tooth structure on the palatal or lingual aspect of the tooth. Next, we want to position the bumper up into the vestibule into mucogingival fold as high up as possible. The greater the distance from the beak, the better the fulcrum. Most importantly, one should never squeeze. We don't want to squeeze hard. We just want to position the bumper as the fulcrum. Now, without squeezing the handles or moving your arm, we start to apply a steady and very slow rotational force in the direction of the bumper. What this does in return is within 30 to 60 seconds, we find that the pressure builds up and the tooth is released into the path of least resistance. So we find that with this unrelenting um, force, we find that the enzymes, the hyaluronidase enzyme, starts to release and eventually the tooth loosens. In fact, some people have mentioned that they hear a pop, an audible pop. Now, at that point, we can remove the tooth. And when we look at this particular example, we see that the tooth was removed in its entirety without having to section. Now, if we were to use traditional methods to remove this tooth, we would try to elevate, and one would clearly find that there's so much decay that most of the coronal portion of the tooth would start to slough off. So by utilizing the physics forceps, we were able to atraumatically extract the tooth. Now, at this point, we would like to curette the socket and remove any type of pathosis or granulation tissue from within the socket. Our goal, especially for a four wall defect, in other words, a socket, is to use a type of graft material that is so easy to use 
where you don't need primary closure and you don't need a membrane. And this is the Osseogen plug, which is available from Golden Dent. And Osseogen plug is consisted of bioactive resorbable calcium apatite. It's a synthetic graft, but it has a collagen matrix made of bovine Achilles tendon. And this creates a nice stiff structure that when it's wetted, it can go and be adapted easily into the socket. Now, as you recall, this root was bifurcated. So in that particular case, we will go ahead and make a little cut and shape the osteogen plug so that it looks like the tooth. What I found personally is that this grafting plug is one of the easiest and affordable ways to clinically deliver a bone graft. The ideal indication is following an atraumatic extraction when all the walls are preserved. In other words, a forward wall defect or a socket. Most importantly, primary closure is not necessary and no membrane is required. And there's several studies that show that the bone grows very predictably. And it is really a great alternative, especially for those who are starting their career with extraction and grafting. And there's no risk of worrying about the dislodgement of a membrane and the graft washing out. The great thing is that it is available in two sizes, a large, which is a 10 by 20 millimeter, or a slim, which is a six by 25 millimeter. Usually I'm finding that the slims are used for anterior teeth and for those premolars that are not bifurcated. And then for molars or bifurcated premolars, I'll use the large and shape that large bullet shape of the osteogen plug so that it looks like the tooth. So utilizing the large size in this particular case, we'll take our scissors and make a cut. We won't make the cut all the way through. I prefer to only go three fourths of the way. And this is so that I don't have two loose pieces um, in the socket, but in fact, two pieces that are merged to one at the coronal aspect, so I don't have to worry about dislodgement. Here you can see no membrane is necessary. We want to ensure that the osteogen plug is flush with all the bony walls within the socket. We don't want it in there loose. And only four months later, we see an ideal ridge. Now, this is an ideal ridge where we can easily use a tissue punch and place an implant. So at this point, we got a radiograph and we found that we can easily use a tissue punch. In this particular case, I used the engaged dental implant from Oco Biomedical because this patient now wanted to walk out with a final restoration or a fixed provisional. Granted that this implant went in with the necessary torque. So the nice thing about this implant is the proprietary bull nose auger tip with the V-threads that change into the square threads to give it some stability. So utilizing a rotary tissue punch, we remove that little portion of the tissue and following the sequence of drills for this implant, we went ahead and placed the implant. Notice again, the day of surgery, this is very atraumatic, very little bleeding. And when we checked it with our Ostel meter, we found that it had a very favorable number of 78. If we look at the various studies that have been out using this technology, in fact, there's almost over 800 papers out there, but if the ISQ, which stands for the implant stability quotient is greater than 70, then we can actually go ahead and immediately load. At that point, I put a stock abutment and scanned it with my CS3600 from CareStream and milled a solid zirconia monolithic crown. This is what we're finding within our practices, that patients are requesting to have all their treatment done under one roof, but also in an efficient yet effective manner. So if we can ideally take a patient from A to Z within our practice, 
then I think we'll find that our practices um, will do quite well. Let's take a look at another example. Here, a patient presented to the practice and she complained of discomfort in the number 30 and 31 areas. Upon probing, we found that the periodontal probe exceeded about nine to 10 millimeters at the mesial buccal line angle. So that was indicative of a vertical fracture. But that still wasn't enough. We wanted to confirm everything. So we took a radiograph and we saw that the margins were not as ideal, however, and the root canals were not as ideal as we would like. But to further uh, look at the areas in question on this, on these teeth, we decided to take a CT scan. And utilizing the CT scan, we were able to zoom in and identify that in fact this patient did have a vertical fracture on tooth number 30 and that on tooth number 31 she had severe buccal and distal decay right at the cervical margin of the crown. So looking at both these teeth further on the CBCT we found that in fact these teeth both need to be extracted. So we anesthetized the patient and utilizing the WAM key, which is also available from Golden Dent, we were able to make a little channel within the crown right at about the height of where the preparation, the occlusal portion of the preparation ends. And since these are elliptical in shape, when you rotate, the crown then is dislodged from the tooth. And so this is what we see. Now that the crown has been removed, we can actually see that this patient's previous dentist was attempting to try and fill the cavity at the cervical portion with amalgam and possibly glass anomer or composite. Well, we know that this tooth has to come out because of the probing depths and what we found on the CBCT. So what I created is something called the osseous cleaning and shaping kit. And so the first three burrs, which are the round burrs, are used to remove any type of granulation tissue from the socket. The second burr, which is the carbide burr, is used for sectioning the teeth or decorticating the bone or demarcating for ridge leveling. And then the last three burrs that go in a straight nose cone of a surgical handpiece are used for leveling bone, which we'll see later in the seminar. So utilizing the carbide burr within the burr kit, we section the tooth so that we can easily remove each root as if it were an individual tooth without putting too much stress on the tooth or on the buccal plate of bone. Well, the first thing we want to do is confirm that our section went all the way through and then using these root picks, we'll go ahead and dislodge one root from the other to ensure that in fact they are separated. Following that, we'll utilize the physics forceps. And since these are lower teeth, all we need to use is the lower anterior, um, or excuse me, the lower universal physics forceps in this particular case, which can also be used on the anterior teeth. So if you look, you can see that the mesial root is removed first. And we got that out in one piece, no need to go digging and looking for root tips. And then we adapt the physics forceps so that the beak is on solid two structure on the lingual aspect. The bumper is going as deep as possible into the vestibule. And we are rotating that out as well. So we have both roots of tooth number 30 already extracted under a minute. As you can see, the bony walls are still intact of this socket. So we'll use our curette and remove any type of granulation tissue. And if we find that there's still some stubborn granulation tissue, then we'll use the sequence of round diamonds to remove any type of pathosis that we just can't get with the curette. 
Well, we utilize the WAM key for the most posterior tooth, which is number 31. And on this tooth, you can clearly see the decay that extends at the cervical portion of the buccal side of the tooth, as well as the distal aspect of the tooth. Using the same technique with the carbide burr, we section the root and we identify that we have in fact sectioned this tooth in the most ideal position. You'd, using our root tips, we'll confirm that they are separated and then use our lower universal physics forcep to first take the mesial root out and then follow with the distal root. Again, we'll curette this socket out, make sure all the granulation tissue or any type of cyst or pathosis is removed from the sockets. Here we always identify the roots to ensure that all the uh, fragments of the tooth or teeth are there. We also take an x-ray to confirm this. And so at this point, we'll use a particulate graft. And in this example, I wanted to show a variety of different types of grafting that we utilize in our practice. We could have easily used an osteogen plug in both sites um, individually. However, I wanted to illustrate a particulate graft with a membrane as well. So this is the Goldoss particulate graft with the collagide membrane. So we always ensure that the membrane is tucked in two millimeters apical to the height of the bone so that it's not dislodged. We'll suture over that. And in addition to that, I found that if we keep the tension of the cheek and of the movable mucosa away from this grafted site, then the graft stays in place much better and less graft material has a chance of being lost. So these are what you call apical mattress sutures. So you start about 10 millimeters apical from the free gingival margin. You extend it into the lingual aspect and loop around and then follow by going down about 10 millimeters from the free gingival margin. What this does in return is stabilize that area when there's movement of the cheek or if we utilize this in the anterior region, it immobilizes the area due to the movement of the lip. This is the x-ray of the graft material immediately after the procedure. And so if we look at the PAs through this whole procedure, it's almost as if it were a storyboard of the process that we took. So what you have highlighted in the blue square is the pre-op radiograph. Then you can see where we've sectioned and removed tooth number 30, followed by the sectioning and the removal of tooth number 31, and then followed by graft. Just a week later, we see that the gum tissue is healing very well. And four months postoperatively, we see that the ridge is finally healed. And now it's time to take a CBCT to start planning two implants in this region. And this is what the periapical film looks like four months later. If we take a look at the CBCT, in my practice, I have the CS8100 from CareStream. We can actually plan virtually where we wanna place the implants. So my goal was to put two five by 10 implants, since these are both gonna be molars, into this region. As you can see, we have sufficient bone thanks to our grafting procedure. So once we've planned that out and we have the information, I'll take an impression using Silgenot from Kettenbach. The beauty of this is it's a polyvinyl siloxane material that can be poured up repeatedly. And it's um, just as inexpensive as alginate um, so that when the assistants take these impressions for diagnostic models, they don't have to be poured up right away, or in fact, they can be forwarded directly to the laboratory for the surgical guides. Here we can see the planning that 3DDX utilized in morphing not only our 
um, images from the CBCT, but also from the dig digital copy of the model. From there, they provided us with a universal guide, and these are open in the buckle aspect because sometimes it's very limited access in the posterior of the mouth. And if the patient can't open wide enough, um, you have to um, place the burr from the buckle position. And so having the sleeve open at the buckle position allows you to do this. Otherwise, you have to use a very, very short burr and you'll find that you can't go to depth. So that's the beauty of these um, buckle slits in the universal guides from 3DDX. So we position the guide. This is a tooth borne guide over the area to confirm that it fits. And I actually like to take a radiograph to see that the sleeves are nice and parallel and where they need to be, just as an in extra insurance. So we anesthetize the patient. And when I anesthetize the patient, I can clearly identify where the keratinized tissue is and where the movable mucosa is. And since we have movable mucosa that may be in the area of where our implants will be placed, we know that we will in fact reflect a flap by making uh, a mid-crest incision so that we have attached gingiva on not only the lingual aspect, but the buccal aspect as well. So this is one technique I highly recommend. Infiltrate the area and the area that you see that blanches is movable mucosa and the other area um, that doesn't move is obviously the keratinized tissue. We always want at least a millimeter to two millimeters of keratinized tissue surrounding an implant. Otherwise, the patient will um, complain of discomfort it, when chewing or if they move their mouth a certain way, or the area around the implant will always be irritated. In this case, again, my preference was the engaged dental implant from Oco Biomedical, and these are both five by 10 in size. You can see they're indicated with the tooth number 30 and 31. Here we have our reflection. We place our guide back on, we follow the sequence of burrs, and then we drive the implants through the guide. And you can see our flap is very minimal. We take a radiograph to complete to um, further indicate that these implants are completely seated, which they are. And we'll place tall healing caps to keep this as a single stage um, procedure so that later when the patient comes back, we don't have to uncover these healing caps, but in fact, they will be uh, visible. And all we have to do is unscrew them for the impression. Here we see the radiographs. Notice that these are platform shifted healing caps. And three to four months postoperatively, we see how nice and healthy the tissue is around those healing caps. So we start the impression process by taking a bite. This is the Futar Bite Fast Set from Kettenbach. We already have our opposing arch that we took with the Silgenaut, and now we will place the impression posts into these areas to take a full lower arch impression. Well, before we do that, we want to check the integration of these implants. As we talked about, the Ostel is one instrument that one may use. There is a new instrument also called the Penguin, which uses a very similar type of resonance frequency analysis to check the integration or stability of these implants. So we check these with this device. And again, we see a very favorable number at 77 and 81 with both implants. So with the OCO Biomedical System, the impression posts and the analogs come with the purchase of the implants. So we place these impression posts into the implants and using our Panacil impression material, will take a full arch impression. Now, one step that I see commonly overlooked is a radiograph of the impression posts to indicate that they're completely seated. So we always wanna take that x-ray to confirm they're seated. Once they are, we'll take the full arch lower impression with our Panacil. 
place the impression pulse with the analog, and now we can forward this to the laboratory for final abutment and crown fabrication. Well, what about using the physics forceps in the anterior portion of the mouth? Let's take a look. This patient presented with periodontal issues on number eight and nine with failing endodontically treated teeth. In this case, we use the VibraJet in the anterior portion. This is also available from Golden Dent and it allows the patient a more cuffed, comfortable injection. In other words, it vibrates so it sends a bunch of impulses to the brain so that the brain cannot detect the difference between the impulses it's getting from the vibration or from the pinch of the needle. Once the patient has been anesthetized, we're gonna use our grafting kit. And in this grafting kit, we'll sever, using these instruments, we'll sever the PDL. And then we'll utilize the separators. Remember, the buccal plate of bone in the anterior section is very delicate and very thin, especially the anterior maxilla. So this is one of the reasons we chose to go with the separators so that we could, in fact, insert it vertically into the PDL space to sever the ligament further and laterally expand the socket to create a larger path for the delivery of the tooth. And you can see we're going around the tooth with the bayonet, we go into the interproximal areas, and then the curved and straight, we go either on the facial or the lingual aspect of the tooth. Now we may implement our physics forceps. And so we take tooth number eight out, followed by tooth number nine. Notice there's no buccal plate on any of these teeth, so the buccal plate is in fact intact. We'll further um, look at that with our curette and make sure that there's no penetration through the facial aspect of bone. And make sure that we remove any type of pathology from within those sockets. At this point, we found that there was in fact a small fenestration on the tooth number eight position. So our goal was to place a membrane on the facial aspect followed by a bone putty. So here we made an incision and using the mucoperiosteal elevator within the golden dent grafting kit, we reflect a mini flap. We'll place our epi guide and we ensure that we go two millimeters apical to the fenestration that was present in the number eight position. And here we have our uh, DBM putty, also from Golden Dent, with cortical chips. So we'll place that within the socket, pull the membrane over, and place it apically on the uh, palatal aspect <clears throat> so that it is two millimeters apical to the crest of bone on the lingual side as well. We suture this area. And since we had taken an impression earlier for a flipper, we were able to deliver the flipper for this patient. And in four months, she will be ready for two implants to be placed into this area. And here you can see in only two weeks how the site is healing very quickly. Well, let's take a look at a larger case. In this case, we'll identify not only extractions and grafting, but when we have to level bone. This patient presented to my practice with a full mouth of recurrent decay as well as periodontal disease. Prosthetically, this was sort of a roller coaster bite to try and salvage some teeth, and she had recurrent decay at the cervical where these uh, margins of these restorations were very defective. So we knew right away that these teeth were non-restorable. Well, one way to start is with impressions, and you could do it with impression material, or you could do it with virtual impressions. This is utilizing the CS3600 from CareStream. And so then we'll fill those other areas in. 
And at this point, we reviewed the variety of different options. And for her budget, she said she wanted to remove all these teeth. She couldn't afford to go with fixed on the top and bottom, but she could afford something in the nine to $10,000 range. So at that point, we knew we could deliver immediate dentures and have some type of overdenture in the lower arch, since the mandibular arch is the one that most people complain about with a denture. So we wanted to stay within her budget of nine to 10,000 and provide um, a very nice solution for her. So the immediate dentures were already fabricated and on the day of surgery, we anesthetized the patient and utilizing our physics forceps, we extracted the teeth when we do these full arch cases, these are under IV sedation, and we'll start in the anterior portion and our work our way around the ridge. Notice we'll always have a throat pack in the posterior region with some type of mouth prop. Once we've extracted all the teeth, I'll use the golden dent grafting kit. And at this point, I'll take the mucoperiosteal elevator and reflect once I've removed all the teeth. Evidently, there were still some root tips remaining, so we used the root tip picks also from Golden Dent to remove any remaining uh, roots. So here you see I'm moving in sections, starting from the anterior and going to the posterior left and then posterior right. At this point, we'll further retract the tissue and curette the sockets to remove any type of granulation tissue any type of pathology or cyst. If we find that there is a stubborn piece of granulation tissue, then we'll use the um, burrs that we utilize for degranulating those areas and reshaping. Once we use the bone leveling burr, we'll follow up with the bone file also from the Golden Dent grafting kit. And in this case, since there were several teeth that we were extracting, we decided to go with the dentin grinder. So with the dentin grinder, what we'll do is remove all the caries and restorations that are from those teeth, put them in the grinder, grind them for about three seconds, and then sort them for 20 seconds, and it's sort of like a vibration. And then at that point, place it in a sodium hydroxide solution for about 10 minutes, and then place it into a phosphate buffer for another two to three minutes. So here we can see the process, and you'll find the particulate graft from the teeth. So the enamel of the teeth acts as the scaffold where the dentin acts as the cancellous type of bone. This way it's not resorbed very quickly, thanks to the enamel. <coughs> and so we'll place this within the sockets after we shape the ridge. Confirm that our denture can seat and then suture the ridge. We'll then continue to the lower arch and do the same thing. Here you can see I'm implementing the separators. This is the bayonet separator going interproximally. Now I'm utilizing the physics forceps to atraumatically extract that tooth. And this tooth that is broken at the gum line, we're using the root tip picks. The nice thing about the root tip picks from Golden Dent is they have a strong shaft to the root pick and they have a handle that's very similar to an elevator. So we don't find these root tips um, picks bending or breaking since they're um, made of reinforced metal and uh, solid. Once all the teeth are extracted, we'll reflect the flap. Utilizing our bone burr, we'll level this down and then we'll utilize our engaged dental implants from Oco Biomedical to place the implants immediately since they have great fixation. At this point, we'll try the upper and lower denture in again, make sure that there's no interferences. 
So on the upper arch, we're going to go to our soft reline. In this particular case, we use the mucoprin from Kettenbach. So we dispense that within the upper immediate denture. In the lower arch, where the healing caps extend through the gum, we'll identify where we need to relieve those areas in the immediate lower denture with bite registration material. We relieve the immediate denture and then also utilize the mucoprin to soft reline this material. This is immediately after the extractions and soft reline. We confirm that the bite is still the most ideal. And six to eight weeks later, the tissue has healed. We've placed our locators with their housings. And we also have a new metal reinforced denture fabricated. So we'll place our adhesive. And in this case, we use the Tokiyama Rebase Fast Set. This is a hard pickup material or hard reline material. We'll mix this until we get a nice consistency and place it into a monojet syringe and pick up the housings um, of these uh, locators. So this is the newer locator, which is called the RTX. And again, we went with a medium retention. The medium retention is about two pounds of retention per implant. So that's about eight pounds of retention between the four of those implants. And here we have the final restoration. Notice we don't have to have deep flanges to stabilize this because this is in fact an overdenture and there are four implants supporting this overdenture. How about difficult extractions? Let's take a look. What is the best approach to extract these teeth? Well, since the coronal portion is already missing, we know that we can in fact go ahead and section this since we can see it utilizing the osseous cleaning shaping kit. Again, this is available through Golden Dent. So we'll utilize this middle burr, the cutting burr. And you can see we've sectioned both teeth. And then utilizing our physics forceps, as well as our root tips, we can remove these teeth. This x-ray illustrates the removal of the teeth and then placement of our osseogen plugs after they've been shaped like teeth. On the opposite arch, we see the teeth that have extensive decay. So these are not restorable as well. So we're gonna follow the same protocol, section the teeth, utilize our root tip to further separate those roots, and then utilize our physics forceps to extract them. We'll place our grafting material, which was again, the osseogen plugs, one for each site that's shaped like a lower molar. And then lastly, in the same patient, we had an upper tooth. And we did the same thing in the upper tooth. Since there was a deep palatal root, so we didn't want to just try to uh, utilize the forceps, we in fact decided it was better to section and then utilize our physics forceps and graft with the osseogen. So again, if we follow the storyboard, we can see our preoperative view, our sectioning that was used in all the cases, the extraction of all the teeth, and then the grafting. The nice thing with the osteogen plug is it's literally under $60 per site to graft and no primary closure is needed. Well, the same patient that we had extracted all five teeth presented for the implants three to four months later. So here we can see the results of our grafting. We went ahead and ordered surgical guides, just like you saw in the first example. So we'll confirm the seating of that. And utilizing the surgical guide, we drill and place the implant. In the lower arch, we placed four engage implants, all five by tens. And then later we saw and we indicated to the patient that she had some areas of decay. So we decided during the healing stage that she needed to get the restorative treatment 
correct it. So we did that while these implants were healing and integrating. So if you notice, this is tooth number 14. This is tooth number 30 and 31. And this is tooth number 18 and 19. So once we completed the restorative treatment with some of those failing restorations, the patient was now ready for the impression appointment. We removed the healing caps, placed our impression posts, took our x-rays, and utilizing the Panacil impression material from Kettenbach, we took the full arch impressions as well as the bite. Here we can see what the lab pours up from this. They'll mount that on an articulator and fabricate uh, abutment and zirconia crown. We have the same on the lower arch. So clinically we can see the abutment is placed and then the crown is seated. We'll find on the lower arch, the abutments are torqued in to 25 to 30 Newton centimeters as well. Confirm that they're placed and seated fully. Then we'll plug the access opening of the abutments with um, either Tempacil or a Teflon tape, and then seat these individual crowns. This pretty much concludes the clinical portion of our presentation. I am pleased to say that I'm one of the faculty members of Amplify Dental. And here you get a chance to see live patient care. In fact, you get to participate in extractions. Last weekend, I believe we removed about 700 teeth. Um, and I'll let Kurt further speak about that. I'm also the uh, Chief Clinical Officer for Ascend Dental Academy, where we teach doctors how to place implants, whether they're freehand or utilizing guided surgery. Thank you. Uh, thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Um, this is Kurt Lawler with Golden Dent. Um, I'm just gonna speak for just uh, a couple moments here. Um, if Lauren, if you could just, uh, Turn the screen over to me, please. I could put on my slides here to uh, just go over a couple of things here before we um, get to the Q&A session and uh, go over a special for um, joining us this evening. So again, my name is Kurt Lawler. I'm with Golden Dent. Uh, hopefully you've heard of our company. Uh, we have a bunch of unique and uh, unconventional dental products. Um, the products that I'm gonna mention here um, just quickly relate to the topic this evening, which was atraumatic extractions and grafting. In one product that's really been um, a great product and interesting for a lot of our, our customers is the osteogen plugs. This is really a great way to get involved in grafting. Um, if you currently maybe aren't comfortable with maybe some of the more advanced cases or, or placing membranes or allograft, um, this is a great product to get involved with grafting. Uh, with the discount this evening, it's only around $42 a bullet. Um, normally, it's around $50 a bullet. Again, no membrane. Um, as Ara mentioned, it's a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a synthetic bone and a collagen carrier, easy to handle, comes in a couple different sizes. This is something that I would recommend taking a look at. Um, even doctors that have been placing allograft and, and different types of membranes for a number of years, this is a great solution or alternative um, that's economical for certain cases where you have a four wall defect. This is our allograft, uh, which is called Goldos. Um, this is a great product. Um, it's an allograft, so we have it in a particulate and a putty form. If you're using an allograft now, now we um, encourage you to take a look at our pricing. We believe it's competitive. And as, in, in addition to the pricing being competitive, we also think it's actually a very high quality um, allograft. So our allograft does have some uh, unique characteristics. Um, it has like a rice-shaped fiber technology that's in the, in the production process of our allograft particulate. It allows it to uh, resorb at different rates than a lot of conventional types of allograft that are on the market. Um, so I do think you'll find that the clinical results are actually quite excellent with the Goldust particulate. 
We also have the putty form. So the putty comes in a syringe. This is just a little bit more of a convenient uh, method of using our allograph. There's no mixing. Um, it does have uh, uh, the ability to, to, to form and the, the handling characteristics of it are a little bit different than the particulate, um, but it's just a different form of the allograft. So two types of membranes. Uh, Dr. Nazarian showed the EpiGuide quickly this evening. This is a really great uh, membrane. We teach in our um, Amplified Dental Training programs that one thing that's really important with the membranes is to make sure that you use a long lasting membrane. Um, the EpiGuide is a resorbable membrane, um, but it's gonna stay in place and protect the socket uh, for a long enough time period to allow the bone to, to uh, to generate within the socket. So these are two membranes, the EpiGuide and the Collaguide. Uh, they're both long lasting resorbable membranes. And you can read a little bit more about those on our website if you're interested um, following the webinar. Uh, but these are two excellent membranes that we've been using for um, quite some time in our programs. So the Smart Dent Grinder, this is a unique um, product and it's, it's an autogenous dentin graft. So we do have this available, and if anybody's interested in uh, contacting us after the webinar, we're more than happy to give you more information on this product. Um, it's an interesting concept. Um, we've had a lot of really positive feedback on it. It's been, um, there are a lot of users of the product. It's been around for a while, and the clinical results are really excellent. So if you wanted to learn more about that product, we do have it, and you can watch some videos and, and uh, read a little bit more information about uh, the Smart Dentin Grinder which uses your extracted teeth to create an autogenous dentin graft. So beyond the aspect of, of you know, having an autogenous graft, which is really the best type of graft material, um, it is pretty economical too. It's around $49 per use, and you'd really be amazed at how many um, cc's of uh, dentin graft that can be produced from just a couple teeth. So it's really economical when you have a larger case um, requiring um, a greater amount of cc of bone, the smart dent grinder is something to take a look at in that particular case. So for instrumentation, we do have uh, all the instruments you need for grafting. This is a simple kit. Um, it has uh, like your bone file, the curat, periosteo elevator, dish. Um, this is a basic kit that's economical if you're looking for something to have all of your graft instruments in one place. Um, to have them ready for your graft cases. This is something to take a look at. It's not very expensive at all, and it comes in a cassette. We also have some uh, other options where we have more advanced instrumentation if you're looking for maybe um, a needle holder that's more advanced or a different type of scissor. We have a couple of different kits available online if you were looking to um, upgrade your grafting instrumentation or replace some instruments that maybe um, you've had for a while in your practice. This is something to take a look at. So for atraumatic extractions, which was one of the, the topics this evening, uh, the physics forceps, a lot of the uh, doctors that are on the webinar this evening already do use our physics forceps, but if somebody's uh, considering uh, maybe changing their atraumatic extraction techniques, or maybe referring more than they currently prefer to, or maybe just looking for a, a more atraumatic uh, system for trying to extract teeth. Uh, the standard series set, which is shown here, is really what most people would start out with. This set will do second molar to second molar, upper and lower. It comes with four instruments. You have your, your upper right, your upper left, an upper interior, and then one lower instrument. This set's gonna provide the best leverage compared to our molar series, which I'll show here in a second. It, the molar series, which is a set of two, which I'll, I'll show here on the next slide, that's more designed for more like erupted third molars and hard to reach second molars. But this set right here is generally what most dentists would start out with to see if they like the concept and the technique. And when I say see if you like the concept or technique, what I mean by that is our products always have 90 days uh, to evaluate the product, make sure it's a right fit for you, um, use them in your practice as many times as you'd like, and if you're not happy with them for any reason, if they're not a right fit, um, you can actually send them back for a full refund. So there's really no risk to ever try the physics forceps. And most people that do try them determine that, you know, it is a good fit for their practice and it does add value. So this is the molar series set that I mentioned. Um, it's the same concept and technique. 
uh, that was explained in the webinar this evening, but these are gonna go straight into the mouth. And so it allows you to get around the cheek restriction. And these are really more designed for erupted third molars, um, hard to reach second molars that you might not be able to get to with the standard series. And it, of course, it would work on first molars too. But if you have the standard series set, um, I think most users that have both, they'll find they get better leverage with the standard series set that I just showed. And so that's generally what most people would start out with if you're looking to, to um, take a look at the physics forceps, I would look at the standard series first. These are our separators. Um, again, I'll just quickly go through this, uh, but we have a straight, a curved, and a bayonet. Uh, we have some really nice micro serrated um, separators, which are it's basically like a uh, micro serrated peritome and some root tip picks. Uh, these are some nice instruments if you're looking for uh, an additional instrument in addition to your physics forceps, or if you wanna do some advanced elevation prior to the physics forceps. These would be uh, some instruments to take a look at. The elevation is not necessary because the physics forceps is a lingual elevator. It's not really a forcep, but these are something to take a look at if you're looking to um, uh, have atraumatic extractions in your practice. So the last thing I'll mention here is just our amplified dental training programs. Um, these are, are taught by, uh, by Dr. Nazarian, uh, the speaker on the webinar this evening. Um, we have a, a couple of really great course offerings. We have an atraumatic extraction program. Um, we just had one last weekend with uh, 27 doctors, and I think we saw around we saw around 85 to 100 patients at that last program last weekend. So it's very hands-on. This is the classroom uh, where we do the the lectures in the morning uh, prior to the hands-on component. This is the group actually from this last weekend for our AMP one extraction program. So you kind of see the clinic floor and sort of what we do at the programs. We have a couple two-day programs too. So this is the day one component where we do a lot of hands-on modeling. Uh, we do grafting and modeling, suturing. Uh, we use a lot of the materials and uh, have a comprehensive lecture before the day two component, which is all hands-on on the clinic floor. So here's Dr. Nazarian doing a demonstration prior to breaking out into the individual operatories. Uh, we go over step-by-step -step, uh, showing atraumatic extractions, the grafting. Uh, we have an immediate denture program now, and we allow you to then do the procedures uh, on the patients that are provided for you. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and, and perfect the uh, procedures that were taught in the lecture component of the courses. So you can see here, we usually put get everybody in a pair of two, and there's plenty of operatories and patients to uh, perfect the techniques that were taught in the classroom. Again, just a couple of photos here. So these are our course offerings. If anybody's interested, you can go to amplifydental.com, but we have uh, four courses now. So we have an extraction component, our extraction course. We have an extraction and grafting course, which is our AMP2 program. And we now have a, uh, extraction, graft, and immediate denture program, which is our AMP3 program. And then also we have a intro to dental implants for the GP, which is our AMP4 program. If anybody's looking for a, uh, uh, if anybody's looking to get into implants, they wanna get a high level overview of where to get started um, prior to maybe going to the Ascend Dental Academy, um, this is a great program to um, get started with getting a basic overview of dental implants, which would be our AMP4 program. So uh, this is what I guess a lot of the doctors that join the evening, they do um, seem to, to regularly join for the specials and the promotions that we do offer from the webinars. And so we know that um, you invested your time with us this evening and we appreciate that. And so for doing that, we do provide a 15% off promotional offer on any of the products that are available on our website or any of our Amplify Dental uh, educational courses. That's a really great savings um, based on the tuition. It's a 15% off promotional code, which is, um, it's now 15. So it's just N-O-W-1-5. And you can learn more about the products at physicsforceps.com or at amplifydental.com or by uh, giving us a call here at the 877 number on your screen. 
We do this 15% off offer for uh, 24 hours only. Uh, we do a quick special. Um, it's actually better than our trade show pricing. And so therefore we just allow it to be valid for 24 hours from, from this evening until tomorrow evening. Um, so it expires tomorrow on the 31st if you wanted to take advantage of any of the specials uh, using the now 15 promotional code. And uh, that's it for me, Lauren. So if you want to, I guess we can start going through the Q&A session. And again, if anybody wants to take advantage of the promotional offer, it's on the screen. And we'll start getting into the Q&A session. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kurt. All right, you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. We got a bunch, so I apologize ahead of time. We're probably not going to get to all the questions. We've got about 15, 20 minutes to try to get to as many as we can. So uh, uh, a number of these questions are, are similar, both asked by multiple people. So I'm going to try to combine a few of them as well. Um, okay, question here. I've used physics forceps, on, and on occasion, the facial bone is broken. Any hints why this happens and how to correct this problem? Yes, I would say one of the things that we've experienced when people come to the um, residency program that we have uh, at the dental school is some doctors have bought the forceps and they haven't gotten the full training on it. Um, so it's very technique sensitive. A lot of people want to squeeze and the key is to rotate and use the bumper as a fulcrum and sort of rotate the tooth out even though we've all been trained in the past to take the forceps, a traditional forcep, and really squeeze hard. Um, depending uh, on the thickness of bone also, sometimes if we do see any uh, buckle plates breaking, it may be a thin aspect of bone, like in a canine area. And having a CBCT in my practice, I can actually see all that before I even touch the patient. And I know in some of those cases, I'm gonna lose uh, a little bit of facial bone, uh, no matter what technique I'm using. So I would say, number one, don't squeeze. Number two, take a look and see if you have a CBCT, those areas that may be thin or may already have some fenestrations of bone because they're probably gonna um, pop off. Um, and if that happens, our AMP2 course is the right course to teach you how to um, graft a type three void. In other words, where like a buckle plate is missing. And I would definitely recommend coming to the level one as well to uh, ideally utilize these forceps and get trained ideally with it. Okay, uh, here's a great question. I was recently at a course and the oral surgeon stated that if it's an atraumatic extraction with four solid walls, a bone graft is not necessary. Research states that there's only one millimeter difference between grafting and not grafting. What are your thoughts? I would agree and disagree. So if the buccal plate is two millimeters or thicker, then I would agree with the oral surgeon that the bone will fill in. If the buccal plate is less than two millimeter, then there's a higher chance of resorption. And so that may not be the ideal um, thickness for an implant. I say, why take a chance? Why not graft them all? If you can, you'll get a more predictable result. Agreed. If you don't use the osteogen plug, could you use bovine bone and place a collar plug on top and suture? Does this technique need primary closure or will the collar plug be okay on top of the graft? One of the things that I found is the osteogen plug's consistency is a little denser. Uh, a collagen plug sort of gets slimy uh, once it gets wet and it's not very stable. So what I found that had happened to me if I place any type of graft covered with a collar plug is the collar plug would be lost in several days and then you would lose some of the graft material. Um, that also would cost you more because using uh, let's say a half cc or one cc of bovine bone is definitely gonna cost you more than an osteogen plug. And then now you just paid another 10 or $12 for the plug as well for the um, uh, collar plug. So I would say, why complicate it? Get the osteogen plug, use that, shape it like the tooth, and you don't have to worry about it. Okay, now in one of the, the cases you did show um, suctioning a molar, um, but I know a lot of times with the physics forceps, you don't have to. So what, you know, what are your thoughts, is it, is it 
can you avoid sectioning or are there certain circumstances where you think it's really critical? So in the lower arch, because the bone is more like D1 or D2, we do recommend to section uh, like the first molar or second molar. Um, if the furcation is above the level of bone, then Golden Den also has cow horns that you could use to remove the tooth as well. Very rarely am I sectioning an upper molar. However, in this particular case, because the palatal root was so long and going into the sinus, I wanted to um, make sure that I took that out as atraumatic as possible and take that out at the at the very end. So that was why, why um, I sectioned the upper molar. However, I would say eight out of 10 times an upper molar because the posterior maxilla bone is usually type four, which is more like styrofoam, or in some cases type three. Um, we don't usually have to section. Okay. Um so, I mean, there's so many different types of, uh, of bone grass. What is your criteria for choosing which type for a specific site? I would say 80% of the time uh, I'm using the Osteogen plug if I'm getting the tooth out without fracturing the buccal plate, and it literally is socket preservation. I found that's the most predictable, and there's less complications of, you know, um, a membrane coming out or them losing the graft. Uh, and the, the quality of the bone is actually very good within 12 to 16 weeks. So that is my go-to for socket preservation. If it's a buccal plate is broken and we're using a membrane, then as Kurt indicated, my go-to is the EpiGuide, usually either with a particulate graft or a bone putty. Okay. Uh, it's probably a question more for Kurt, but uh, do you ship to Mexico? Uh, you know, um, we, if anybody's on our, um, I guess they can contact us if they want, but our dealer, our dealer in Mexico is COA International. So it's just COA. I, I guess they're, they're a big company in Mexico. They can supply um, the products to uh, Dennis in Mexico. Okay. What about if someone's having a, any issue, like with their separators? Uh, one person said that they, you know, they're the tips they are deforming slightly. Is that normal? Is there a warranty on the um, on the separators? Yeah, I mean, all of our products are are you know made here in uh, in, in USA for the most part. Besides the ones we do import, um, some products from from Europe. Um, yeah, so I mean, they're all high quality products. I mean, we stand by our products. So if anybody has any. Uh, concerns with a product obviously would to to contact us and and uh, we, would, we would take care of that I mean the physics forceps have a, have a 10 year warranty on them so um, our company's only been around since 2007 so if anybody ever to have an issue with one of those um, you know we, we just we replace them with you know no questions asked so if anybody has a problem with anything or if, um, it's mentioning something with a separator obviously if they contact us we'll um, do something to make it right okay um, all right. If if someone's having difficulty getting the, the grafting material all the way down to the deepest portion, how critical is that? Um, what type of graft are we talking about? The particulate or the osteogen plug or either one? They, they didn't specify it. So uh, oh, they did. They said they get the bone um, grafting well, material. The socket, the socket heals from the bottom up. So I would say if it's like a millimeter or two, it's not the end of the world. However, what I have seen is when doctors don't remove all the pathology from the bottom of the socket, and that creates a problem. You want to remove all the granulation tissue, uh, cyst, or pathology from the bottom of the apex of the of the socket. If you haven't, if you've removed it all and you haven't gotten the graft material all the way down, uh, it still works quite well. So I'm not too worried about that. Okay. Um, what would be your recommendation for scheduling an appointment for extraction and bone graft and sutures? I mean, obviously, you've been doing it for a long time and it got a few thousand under your belt, but uh, what do you normally suggest for people for scheduling? Um, so usually in my practice, it's about a half hour for an extraction. And that gives us time when we're um, anesthetizing the patient, extracting the tooth, and placing some type of graft material. In my practice, and what I recommend for all the doctors out there, is the best practice management or marketing thing that you could ever do 
is get your emergency patients in. There are several patients that come in that couldn't get into their dentist's office that we get them in and on the day of the emergency, we actually will anesthetize them, give them time to get numb and extract the tooth and take the source of the infection out and graft. And right there, they're patients for life. Uh, they, they feel comfortable with us. They feel good that we were able to get them in and um, address their needs uh, as well as, you know, take care of, uh, take, take care of their pain. So I would say um, if you get the training and you learn how to do this in an efficient, effective, and predictable manner, then it really shouldn't take you a long time. You can easily put that patient in chair two and uh, really promote your practice. It's a great practice builder. Okay. A um, couple questions about the dent and grinder. Uh, the first was, uh, can we save the grafting materials for future use and how much is the unit? And then another question about what happens to the pulp with the dent and grinder. So I'll let Kurt talk about the price. Um, you don't want to save the graft. I would not recommend saving the graft. Um, so you want to use the graft the day that you're extracting these teeth and doing it. Um, I would say it's a little overkill to use the dentin grinder for one tooth. But when I'm doing a quadrant, an arch, or a full mouth, that's when I um, utilize the dentin grinder, and it's worked great for that uh, indication. The sodium hydroxide will go ahead and remove any of that tissue um, because it's in there for 10 minutes. So what I usually do is after I've gotten a few teeth out, my secondary assistant will go ahead and start cleaning any decay or any fillings from the teeth and start the grinding process so that we'll always have a uh, dentin graft uh, coming our way. We don't wanna just like do the whole procedure and then wait for them to go through the process. So as we get three to four teeth, she'll take them, she'll clean the teeth of any decay of any tissue or let's say there's tartar on there, um, remove any fillings, uh, put it in the sodium hydroxide uh, liquid after it's been ground down, and then put it in the buffered saline, and then it's ready to roll. Okay. Cost, I'm Kurtwood sorry. can talk about yeah. that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, prior to the discount, the, the price on the unit's around $1,500. Um, it comes with six uh, chambers, the, the consumable components of the kit, and the, like the grinder motor. So going forward, the cost is around 50 bucks per use, which is which is actually really economical when I mean, you can easily do a full arch and multiple socket sites with um, just a couple teeth being ground and, and turned into the dent and graft. So it's around it's around fifteen hundred dollars, maybe thirteen hundred range or so after the discount and then um, fifty dollars per use going forward. OK. A um, couple, I want to really try to get some, as many questions as we can. A couple of um, questions that are kind of related to each other. If you use a resorbable membrane, do you have to have primary closure? And what happens to the coronal part of the plug when exposed to the oral environment when you don't have primary closure? So using the Osteogen plug, you do not need primary closure. Um, that in turn will ter turn into tissue at the coronal part and anything at the crest of the bone turns to bone. So it's not like if you overfill the plug, you're gonna have bone growing above the crest of bone. That's just not gonna happen. Using an epi guide, I was a big uh, advocate for pericardium uh, membranes in the past. However, pericardium, when it's exposed to the oral cavity, starts to have uh, a very not nice uh, smell. The epi guide, since it's synthetic and it's size specific, um, can be exposed in, uh, to the oral cavity without primary closure, and it does not create a problem. So both those materials work very well um, in, in my practice and in many other practices uh, if you don't get primary closure. Okay, uh, speaking of bad smells, do you disinfect with anything routinely? And in the case of active infection, would you recommend some type of antibiotic? So yes, so after we've extracted the tooth, we'll use the curette to remove any granulation tissue or pathology. We'll then follow up with the um, degranulation burrs. 
Um, at that point, we'll irrigate with surgical saline. I'm not a big advocate of using like Paradex and things like that too, or peroxide in the socket. Um, so I don't recommend that. I would just use sterile saline and then uh, place the graft. Now, I have on occasion put gentamicin and mix that with the graft material. You can get it as a liquid form from let's say Salvin or Henry Schein um, and wet the graft material before you put it in, if you like. Are there circumstances like, like if there's an active infection that you wouldn't graft immediately? Um, so when we look at active infection, if there's pus coming out from the site, then yes, I, I probably would not graft then. I would allow it to heal for two weeks and then re-enter and graft at that point. Okay. Uh, let's see, I wanna make sure to try to get some of these. Um, hey, Laura, if I can just mention, we always get those questions, so I'll just answer it. For, so for our, our live patient programs, uh, the attendees do the surgical procedures on the patients, uh, but since it's a teaching facility, we do it at the University of Detroit Mercy Dental School. Um, there's, you do not need a Michigan license. All of our courses are here in Detroit. Um, so we, we consistently get dentists from all over the 50 states and Canada. Uh, you do not need a special license or um, any special paperwork, so to speak. Um, you just obviously have to be uh, a licensed dentist in, in the U.S. or Canada, and we ask for a couple pieces of documentation prior to the programs. But yeah, you can absolutely uh, work on the patients at our programs um, that are live patient-based, hands-on programs. Great. Um, another question about the um, about the plug. Uh, if you're if you're not getting primary closure, what happens to the coronal portion of the plug? Are we talking about the osteogen plug? I would assume so, yeah. Yeah, the osteogen plug. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So like I was saying, with the osteogen plug, the coronal portion, because it's the um, material is a bovine Achilles tendon, that area fills in with tissue. And because we have the osteogen bioactive calcium, that turns into bone when it's surrounded by bone. So when placing the osteogen plug, you want to ensure that that plug is in the socket tight and touching all the walls. So essentially the um, synthetic bone is acting as a catalyst to um, initiate bone in that region. And then the bovine Achilles tendon is acting as the base or um, the way that it's uh, provided. And so any part that's above the level of bone is turning into tissue as you saw with the examples. Okay. Um, at the time of extraction, do you encourage bleeding of the socket to saturate the plug with blood at the time of placement? Absolutely. I, I think bleeding is very important. So that's why we created those burrs um, to decorticate the bone. If you find that um, you don't have bleeding, then um, we recommend initiating it by decorticating within the socket. Okay. For the... Um... For the dentin grinder, what kind of bone do you obtain after grafting? Is it bone or, or is there any literature about that? Uh, there's several studies. I think you can find them on the Golden Dent uh, website. I'll let Kurt answer that. But yeah, this has been, it start, was started in Israel and it's been in Europe for several years uh, and there are several papers on it. It's a great quality bone. Yeah, they, they, say, you, they say your uh, teeth are the, you know, same composition as bone. So, I mean, it, it's, it's about as close as you get is to like an autogenous graft, which is, a, they, they call it a dentin graft. And, and you can read, um, you know, various studies and, and links on our webpage, or if you, you contact us, we'll be more than happy to get you um, the, the proof for the scientific studies that have been done that it, that it does work. I, I do know the users that do use it from us um, consistently order the chambers and are having good clinical results. So, so we, we do know it works. Let's get to a couple more questions. Um, how long do you leave the sutures in place with plugs, EpiGuide, and Collaguide? So, um, if the so the EpiGuide takes six to eight weeks to resorb. Um, so, when we're using the Osteogen plugs, I'm using chromic gut sutures. 
So those are usually dissolving within seven to 10 days on their own. When I'm using the EpiGuide, I'm usually using a monofilament suture um, or uh, like a glycogen uh, type of suture. And those usually are removed after two to three weeks. Okay. Well, I think we're going to wind it down here. I, I, there's no way, like I said, that we can get to all the questions. We want to be respectful of everyone's time, but uh, I wanted to give both you gentlemen a chance to to give us some parting comments, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a, a night. Well, I wanted to thank uh, you for having us on, Dr. Levine, uh, to share uh, atraumatic extraction and grafting techniques uh, for our doctors. Uh, I can tell you the number of patients presenting to the practice that are needing extraction and graft is, is growing exponentially. And I think that all general provider, general dentistry providers should be able to um, offer this to their patients um, and to be able to build the foundation for implant placement in the future. And still, there are teeth that you may not be able to handle, but I would say nine out of 10 of them, uh, you should be able to handle with the instruments that we um, showed this evening. Great, Kurt? All right, yeah, thanks everybody, I appreciate your time. Uh, you know, take a look for uh, future webinars. We try to do them every couple months or so, and I uh, hope everybody appreciate or enjoyed the uh, content this evening, and give us a call tomorrow with the number on the screen if you have any questions or want to learn more about our products. Appreciate it. Have a great well, I night. Thank, thank I want to thank both of you. Uh, people probably couldn't tell that the R was a little bit under the weather, uh, but uh, you, like I said, you would not be able to tell. He was a real trooper. Um, but um, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to, the, to give us this fantastic information. Um, I especially want to thank Kurt and Golden Dent for their sponsorship. These are not easy webinars to do when you get a thousand people registered and you're, you're promoting it out there on social media and emails and putting the whole thing together. Uh, it's not an easy process. So we are very, very appreciative of Kurt and Golden Dent for their ongoing sponsorship. And we have a number of our clients who uh, are using uh, Physics Forceps and all the Golden Dent products. They've done the training. These are fantastic opportunities. Um, I would certainly take advantage of the special. Um, they also, they mean what they say and they say what they mean. So when, when Kurt says, hey, this special is good for 24 hours, that means don't call them on Friday and wonder why you still can't get the special because that, this is it. Um, but uh, I would highly recommend that you take advantage of it. Uh, their return policies, their, their money back guarantees are, are great. You're, you're not going to be disappointed. We, I don't think, of, I can't think of anyone that's actually ever returned anything, but uh, th th this is a great uh, company to work with. So. We thank uh, everyone for joining us this evening. As I said, I know that your time is valuable. We try to do these webinars on a regular basis. We've got one next week uh, on appointment scheduling, um, and we're ideally going to get uh, Kurt and Golden Dent to do another one in the next couple of months because uh, we get such great turnout. So thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you got something out of it, and we look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.